Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. If he has died on the cross and given us that victory, that free gift, would he not also take care of all our needs? And we were just singing that his healing is in his hands. Amen. Amen. We're in this series called The New and Living Way, based out of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 22. And we've talked about new covenant, new birth, new heart, new fruit, new family. And now we're on new purpose, new purpose. And the last uh, two messages were based upon this particular topic of the new purpose. You know, you might think that Jesus has done his work on the cross for us. Is there something for me to do? Is there any works that I need to do? Isn't it uh, wrong to say that there is works that needs to be done on my part? Is that uh, appropriate to say that? And today we will look at the new purpose and particularly we'll look at the new works, uh, good works that we are supposed to be doing if we are in Christ. And so we'll look at that in detail. Let me just uh, go on to tell you the main verse we'll be focus on, focusing on is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10. Ephesians chapter 2, two verse 8 through 10. But as you're going there, in a sermon entitled, Don't Do You, You Are Created for a Divine Purpose. You Are Created for a Divine Purpose. When we talk about you do you, or do you, bro, what we're trying to say is you do what is pleasing in your eyes. You do what's best for you. But if you are truly in this new creation, if you're newly in Christ, if you are born again, then you don't just do you. You are created for a divine purpose, and we will study that today. You know, if you look at, have you guys heard of the Steinway Grand Piano? You know, I was looking at a documentary regarding it, and it traced the meticulous care that goes into creating one of these fine instruments. I was looking also at the cost, and the cost was anywhere from, you know, 15000 at the cheapest for a used one to $50,000. You know, from the cutting of the trees until the piano shows up in the uh, showroom, it takes countless adjustments, many, many hours and days of work by a skilled craftsman, and it takes about a year, one whole year, for one of these to be made. And if you ask some of the uh, famous musicians, like Arthur Rubinstein said, a Steinway is a Steinway, and there's nothing else in the world. And so professional musicians, people that play at Carnegie Hall, say that there's a difference between a Steinway and just mass-produced pianos. Amen? Today, God's Spirit dwells in our hearts as believers, and we are the temple of the living God, as it says in 1 Corinthians. Yet our call uh, from the craftsman, which is the Lord Jesus and His Holy Spirit, is that He would work upon each of us. And so we will look at how God, we need to be willing to let God work for God's purposes to take place in our life. Uh, so let us look at this particular verse, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may say or boast, uh, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It talks about works there, and it says that we are not saved through works, but it says that we are created for good works. So there is a difference there. Amen? So we are not trying to uh, say that salvation is through our works. Uh, uh, this is what differentiates Christianity from all the other religions of the world that says you need to do something on your part to earn your moksha or your salvation. And so here, Jesus has already done the work upon the cross 
the Lord sent his only begotten son to die on the cross and for anyone who believes in him and uh, decides to follow him wholeheartedly uh, as we talked about with new life with a new heart he uh, comes in and we're able to uh, commune with him and we're able to do good works so salvation is not earned by our good works we are saved by Christ alone believing in Christ alone through faith it is not our own doing. Uh, if it, it, it is not a gift of God. If it could be purchased or if it could be because of works, the richer folks could buy their salvation. But no, Christ has done the work once and for all. So substituting human effort for God's gift to achieve salvation is legalism. So we should not do that. But at the same time, uh, we know that we are saved for good works. Because of the grace or the charis of God, the Greek word there is charis, it is unearned. It is not a reward of our good works. We did not deserve it. It was completely on the benevolence of God. It was a kindness of God, nothing expected in return, that if you believe on the Lord Jesus, that you would be saved. And truly saved, if you're truly saved, then there is a change that happens. In Corinthians, it says you become a new creation. And that's what we've been studying, uh, uh, that, that there is a change that happens. So if we are saved, truly, we should be doing good works, right? Because of the free grace that he has given us, there's going to be definitely a change. In James chapter 2, verse 26, it says, faith without works is dead. And works are the fruits that you are truly rooted in Christ. So the root is Christ, and the fruit is the works that we are called to do. If we are truly rooted in Christ, if his spirit is flowing through our life, then we will have good works as a, a, a byproduct. See, there's a difference between this old man and this new man. Before you were... Uh, had been born again before this conversion experience each and every child each and every person born into this world has Adam's sin nature and our desire is to do the works of the flesh we have filthy desires we are naughty by nature we are self-satisfying we are self-glorifying and we are self-centered but Ephesians 4 28 says that we should, after being born again, not just stop doing bad things, but there needs to be a complete turnaround that we should do good things instead. It specifically talks about someone who is stealing. They should stop stealing, but that doesn't end there. Instead, they should work with their hands so they can help others. So we are called for good works. Even though we're not saved by good works, we are called for good works. And what might this good works be? It is a, a, a reborn man with a new purpose is, is brought, in, brought into this rebirth experience for good works that reflect the fruit of the Spirit. And it needs to be done in love, not out of obligation, but it needs to be done in love. If you study James, you can clearly see that. And in James, it talks about providing clothing to the naked, drink to the thirsty, food to the hungry, visiting orphans and widows, hospitality for strangers and visitors, visiting the sick and going to the imprisoned are just a few that are mentioned in the book of James. But let's study this portion that we uh, have uh, started to look at in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 in particular. Verse 10 in particular. So, but I hope that you understand that saying that you need to have good works, the fruit needs to match the root, which you say that you're in Christ, is not legalism at all. Yes, it is uh, saved by grace only, but we need to have good works as an inherent nature of the free grace that we have received. God, in verse uh, 10, Paul is saying, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Let's look at this a little bit more in detail. In the King James Version and ESV, it says, we are God's workmanship. But if you look at the New Living Translation, it says, we are God's masterpiece. And in the NIV, it says, we are God's handiwork. And if you look back to the original Greek, the word, the English word poem comes out of this. It is poema. And it is only mentioned in two places in the Bible. 
So before we go into that, let me say that each and every person that is born again becomes a piece of clay or a piece of art or a poem in the hands of the Lord. See, the, the work of art doesn't have any right to say, why, am I, why are you cutting me here? Or why are you doing this or that to me? You are the object of the artist, which is the Lord Jesus and, and, and our Father God. For it says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. The only other person, uh, place where this is mentioned is Romans 1 verse 20. When it talks about uh, how a person from the beginning of time by looking at the creation of God, can tell uh, about God even before Jesus came into the world just by looking at nature. And it's talking about his creation. In the same way that he talks about creation as a poem of God, when God said, let there be light, let there be trees, let there be animals, uh, when God did that kind of great work on day one through seven, uh, that same emphasis is given to poema, which is what we, me, you and I are when we are saved. We are saved. God was wielding his full, greatest, and most creative power when we are born again. So the rebirth is similar to the creation that happened in Genesis 1. We are the poema of God. God uh, takes creation and salvation as two amazing creations of God, the nature that was created. And when God works in a person to be born again, both are equated to say that those are two amazing and creative powers of God. So there needs to be a true change that takes place in our life. If we have a true salvation experience, it is not something that we just confess with our mouth, uh, but we have to have an inward change that happens afterwards. Because that verse says, for we are his workmanship, God is the artist and we're the art in his hand, uh, where the uh, a work of art or the poem in his hand created in Christ Jesus. Yes, our salvation comes from the Lord for good works. And so we will look a little bit more into what this good works is. In Greek, good is uh, agathos, or that's where you get the name agatha, uh, just innately good. And then there's ergon, where we get the English word energy. So uh, that's works. So agathos Ergon is the Greek for this. And Jesus, it says, uh, is the, the means by which we have been saved through salvation. And we are saved not just to stay the same, not to go back into our old ways. We are created for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We'll look at each one of those individually. So God, I would like to bring four points about good works because today's point is the new purpose. I am created with a new purpose, which is for good works. So specifically, we'll look at four points. Uh, God uh, expects good works of us as a byproduct of him saving us and giving us this eternal life, uh, this free gift, charis, grace of the Lord. And so good works as a return to him is something that we are expected to do. And one Good works are a believer's love offering to God. If you go to Ephesians chapter 5, uh, and we'll look at uh, 1 through 9 there, imitate God, live a life filled with love, and be uh, a pleasing aroma to God. See, when we are doing good works after we being truly saved, we are a worship or a love offering, an aroma to the Lord and it says, just as Christ Jesus was. We need to follow the example of the one who saved us. And we need to be obedient in the things that are good. Let me take a step back and say, the world likes to say or define what is good. But the definition of good is not set by your politicians. It is not set by your friends. The word of God is a standard for what is good. If it is in the word of God, it is permissible, but otherwise it is not. So, so uh, as we live out this life, you might say this is the 21st century. There's different things out there and it's hard for me to do good works. But God is saying 
that by doing good works, believers are showing the love relationship with the Lord, and we are bringing our worship, which is an aroma to the Lord. So what type of aroma are we in doing good works? We're a pleasant or sweet aroma to the Lord's nostrils, or are we doing bad works, which then becomes a stench to the nostrils of God? What are those? Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, and greed. Such sin have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talks, coarse jokes, they are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. That thankfulness uh, in our daily life is a pleasant aroma to the Lord. It's our worship to the Lord. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, and for greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. Can we examine ourselves? Do we have greed for material things? And if that's the case, we are a stench to the nostrils of God. Or are we pleasing aroma to the Lord in our worship? Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will be falling upon the ones that disobey. Don't participate in the things that these people do. For once they were full of darkness, but, but once you were full of darkness like them, but you, now you have the light from the Lord, so live as people of the light. For this light within you produces only what is good, right, and true. The light that was shined upon us when we got saved needs to be kept lit daily uh, by, the, by uh, trusting in, and reading the word of God, by the help of his Holy Spirit, and then we're able to produce what is good, right and true works in our life. So first, good works are a believer's love offering to God. Second, good works are a witness to our unsaved society. We are to live godly lives in this pagan society. And in 1 Peter it says, Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your soul. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. And even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God that judges the world. And again, in Matthew, it says, in the same way, let your good works, your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father. You are the newspaper that the, this world will uh, read about Jesus. And so the unsaved society will look at you and uh, see that he claims to be a Christian, but he doesn't life, his life doesn't really uh, jive with that. It doesn't really match up with that. Or are we living out properly so we could be a witness to the unbelieving neighbors? Hey, there's something special about you. What is different about you? Has anybody ever come and said that to us? Uh, if that's the case, we're doing good works. And uh, we were discussing this in, in, in Sunday school. As we start our day, let's, I, I heard this from Elizabeth Elliot, the wife of Jim Elliot, who was a, a, a missionary that died in South America. She said that uh, she, as she starts her day, uh, her prayer is, Lord, what is your purpose for me today? You know, whether I'm a nurse or I'm an engineer, wherever I'm going today in my regular workplace, in the people that I encounter in the store or in my driving, uh, as I'm uh, in my workplace, can I be a witness? How do you want me to bring Christ to the unsaved society? Thirdly, good works are an edifying example for fellow believers within the walls of the church. Teach the older men to exercise self-control, be worthy of respect, to live wisely, that they must have sound faith and be filled with love and patience. Teach the older women to live in a way that honors God. They must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. Instead, they should teach others to what is good. The older woman must train the younger woman to love their husbands and their children, to live wisely, to be pure, to walk in their, to work in their homes, to do good, and to be submissive to their husbands. Then they will not bring shame on the word of God. In the same way, the young men are to live wisely, and you yourself must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind. Let everything that you do reflect the integrity 
and the seriousness of your teaching. Here, Titus is being instructed and he's saying, be an example to everyone in the church, an example to others. Uh, it talks about older men being examples, older women being examples to younger women. And it talks about the young men and how we are to live wisely. So good works are an edifying example to our fellow believers. And lastly, the fourth point, good works are in God's plan, the integral part of God's eternal plan for mankind. To bring many sons to glory, he, uh, in his plan, had us growing in our faith, leading an honorary and exemplary life after coming to know the Lord Jesus, living a life that is pleasing to him, in communion with him, with the Holy Spirit guiding us so that we can have eternal life. In 2 Peter chapter 1, in 3 through 10, it says that uh, we have great and precious promises, the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. And in verse 10, it says, Dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things that you will never fall away then God will give you a, a, an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Not everyone that calls unto me will be uh, there with him on that day. Just because you claim to be a Christian, uh, you cannot be there with him. You need to prove it after you're saved by the free gift uh, that you need to uh, live out your life each and every day confessing your sin. It is not by our works so much, but it is by the blood of Jesus, trusting in him daily, uh, reading the word daily, and obeying the Holy Spirit, and living in communion with others that we're able to do good works and attain eternity. In Titus 2, 11 through 14, uh, specifically, it says, For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people, and we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures, we should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God while we look forward to the hope uh, to that wonderful day when the Lord Jesus, uh, our God and Savior, will be revealed. He will give us his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us his very own people totally committed to doing good deeds. So it's saying that we must have good works, a type of legalism, if we say that you must have good works to have salvation, it might be. Because on the cross, the Lord has done his work and, and believing in him is how we are saved. But we need to work out our salvation afterwards. We need to have daily purification. We need to have a, a life connected with the vine, which is the Lord Jesus. And we need to be living out. And that's what we've been studying, having a new heart, having a new fruit, having a new purpose in our life. And one of the purposes the Lord has for us on this earth uh, is to do good works. And the good works are our way of offering worship to the Lord. The good works are our witnesses to the unsaved souls. The good works are a way of edifying our fellow brothers and sisters. And a good way is an integral part of God's eternal plan uh, to bring many sons to glory. So if you want eternal life, you also need to be doing good works. And good works is not just uh, deeds, it's not just actions, it's thought. Uh, our thought life, our character, and our action all needs to match up. And then we are able to achieve um, salvation uh, through Christ and then able to live that out with good works also through Christ. If you look there, you will also see a couple of other interesting uh, points if you go back to the uh, Ephesians portions. It says, which God had prepared beforehand. Ephesians chapter 1, it told us how we are adopted into Christ. And God knows who is his from not before you got saved, not before you were born, but before the foundation of the world, he has chosen the ones that are saved. He knows you and me, and he has prepared his handiwork. He cuts out what needs to be cut out, and he makes us into a perfect work of art. And uh, through the, the, the redeemed blood of Christ and the good works that it enables us to do, we're able to walk in it. See, uh, first it says prepared beforehand. 
God is in sovereign control of his poem or his handiwork. If you are a child of God, you can rest easy that as you walk out of here, if you, were, if you get hit by a truck, then that God meant that your life is now complete. You have done what you needed to do on the earth. That if uh, you don't have to worry about uh, different things, that you know that you're under the sovereign control of the Lord because you are a piece of art in his hand. And he is the one that controls how long you live or every part of your life, who your friends are. And, but there is a portion here, the, the end, it says we should walk in them. See, there's a part for us. We cannot just be passive and say, oh yeah, my life is in God's hand and uh, you know, whatever he does, he will do. We have a role in that as well. We need to walk in it. We need to walk in it. Walk by faith into what God has destined for us. Even the hair on our head is numbered. Knowing the will of God is, is a topic that is very difficult for us to understand. And uh, we sometimes have a hard time with that. But uh, with the help of reading the word of God and knowing what is good that the Lord wants me to pursue, with the help of the Holy Spirit that is sent uh, as my helper and him guiding me daily, I can walk in the will of God easily and I need to walk in it. I can't just be passive and say, God will take care of it. I need to walk in it. You see the example of Tabitha of good works in Acts chapter 9. She did what she could, right? We see that in Joppa, there was this lady, Tabitha, or her other name was Dorcas. She was full of good works, it says, and uh, acts of charity. And we see that uh, when Peter uh, was called, all the widows stood beside him weeping and showing the tunics and other garments that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Even Dorcas was able to exceed in good works with what she was given. And how about you? So when I started the message, I said, the sermon title is, Don't Do You. The world tells us the, the pattern of this world is to uh, do what is pleasing to the eyes, right? The culture says, put yourself first. But the word of God says, put up uh, with others. Jesus first, others second, and you're third. This world says, outdo yourself by working hard and having fun, whatever it takes to make your dreams come true. And what's in the Bible says, do unto one another, uh, showing honor to one another, thinking of others better than yourselves. This culture says, do good for yourselves and put up everything and see how many likes you'll get and the accomplishments of this world. But... The word of God says, see the good of others, do good works for the people in the church and outside the church and be there for others. And it, this world says, exalt yourself so you can be number one. But the, world of, uh, the word of God says, count others more significant than yourselves. Crucify yourselves daily, take up your cross and follow him is what uh, the word of God tells us. But that is countercultural to what is talked about in this world. As I talked about with the Steinway piano, there's nothing like it in the world. When people play it, there's an exquisite sound that people who know music is able to hear. Just like that, we are a handiwork. We are a masterpiece. We are a poem of the Lord. It takes a while. This takes a year to build, but it is special. It's more than your mass-produced uh, keyboards or even pianos. There is hand work that is done over time, and the Lord is um, there working through that. So there's great joy in understanding that our salvation is not based on our works, but rather is a product of, uh, rather that works is a product of our salvation. Amen. Good works comes from true faith. There's important questions that we need to ask in our lives. What will be the center of my life? Will it be the worship of my God? What will be the character of my life? Will it be to grow in discipleship with others? What will be the contribution of my life? Will it be the life of service to others around me? What will be the communication of my life? Will it be the missional spreading of the good news of the gospel by my thoughts, my character, and my action? 
So don't do you do what you were supposed to do. The master craftsman, the Holy Spirit is working in each one of us. As I'll end here, I think it was mentioned here in this church many years ago. You might know the story behind I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. It's a song from Assam, India. And uh, there was a, 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 a tribesman who was saved, his wife and two children. And the chief of the tribe said, uh, give up Jesus. And then they shot down the two sons. And he said, I have decided to follow Jesus. And then now's your chance to save your wife. And he said, no turning back, no turning back. And then the wife was also bowed, uh, bow, bowed uh, with an arrow and killed. And then he, they said to him, this is your last chance to save your own life. And he said, the cross before me, the world behind me. We are called unto good works and there's no other way around it. And it will be a natural byproduct if you're truly saved, if you're truly born again. We are new creation and our heart is changed for good works. Let us go forward in good works these days. May God bless you all with these words. Amen.